Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Dr. Susan Landers about avoiding burnout and the importance of supporting mental wellness in the workplace. Dr. Susan Landers, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I am excited to have this conversation with you today. We're going to be focusing on burnout in the workplace, how we can avoid burnout, and really the importance of supporting mental wellness in the workplace as a leader for ourselves and for our team. As we get started, I wanted to share Susan's bio with everybody. Dr. Susan Landers is a neonatologist at pediatrician with extra training in the care of sick and premature babies. After attending Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama, Dr. Landers graduated in 1973 and received two BS degrees in biology and chemistry. She attended medical school at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. After completing medical school, she completed three years of pediatric residency training at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School in Dallas, Texas. Next, she completed three years of neonatal fellowship at Baylor College of medicine-affiliated hospitals in Houston, Texas. She practiced academic neonatology for 14 years and private practice neonatology for 18 years. While caring for patients full-time in private practice, she served as a speaker for the Texas Department of State Health Services. She was the medical director of the Mother's Milk Bank at Austin and served on the Milk Bank's board of directors. Additionally, she served on the executive committee of the section of breastfeeding for the AAP. Together with her husband, Dr. Philip Berry, she raised three children, one son and two daughters. Her family resides in Austin, Texas. And you can find more about her on her website at susanlandersmd.com. Uh, what a wonderful background. Anything else you would like to add by way of your, your professional background, your personal background, provide context for the conversation today? Well, you covered everything beautifully. <clears throat> I do want to add that um, even though I've done lots of different things, I was mainly a NICU doctor. Neonatal intensive care units are ICUs for babies. And for 34 years, I practiced in a NICU, and there was a lot of critical care going on there, premature babies, sick newborns, (coughs) excuse me, um, newborns with birth defects. And so the reason that we're talking today, I think, is that over my long career, I had lots of night call, lots of weeks with when I in which I worked 60 hours, lots of emotional stress, you know, sometimes little babies die in the NICU (laughs) and you have to deal with the parents and the families. Um, And I did fine for the first 30 or so years of my career. I managed to use my resilience and use some techniques for self-care that I had learned along the way. And I stayed um, healthy. And it was not until my early 60s that I began to feel really physically exhausted. Even a 50 hour work week would, would tire me out. And I used to work six regularly. Night call felt so onerous going into the hospital. I just dreaded it. Then I noticed more emotional exhaustion. Some of the cases were just so sad and so much trouble. And there was conflict about when care was futile and when it was not. And so I noticed those 
things, but they weren't that different from what I had seen off and on in the NICU in prior years. What was different is that I became detached from my patients, John. I actually felt like I was disengaged from them. You know, I, I, I didn't go up to the mothers and talk to them as much. I didn't say, how are you doing? Tell me how things are going. And then I noticed, the final thing I noticed was a sense that I wasn't making any difference. Now, medicine is a career, like others, where people do it because it makes them feel really good, really fulfilled. There are lots of jobs in which people feel fulfilled, but medicine is just the diamond in the sky, I think, because you make people, people feel better. And when you heal a little baby and when you take care of a little baby in the NICU for four or five months and you're at their delivery and then you see them go home, there's no better feeling in the world than just the ultimate of being fulfilled, being that part of a family, being intimate with a family. And at the very end, I felt like I wasn't making any difference. And when you lose that self-efficacy, that is when burnout is indisputable. So I think the reason we're talking today is because of my personal experience with burnout and because I've been doing some writing about burnout, I think it's really important, as you do, to get these issues out on the table because modern day worlds are experiencing burnout in lots of different fields. Yeah, and, and just to put a fine point on this, and I, I'm really excited uh, to have this conversation generally, but also recognizing that with first responders, healthcare professionals, um, nursing, uh, medicine, the NICU, all of these things, right? That this was a challenging profession, a challenging place to be pre-pandemic. It's, it's even been, been more challenging during the pandemic. And we know that generally speaking across uh, the US, for example, that we've seen heightened levels of anxiety, stress, uh, depression, burnout, all of these things have increased over the last 20 plus months um, and, and more so within the healthcare field. Uh, yes. And I, I do a lot of research in the employee engagement and satisfaction space, you know, the motivations of employees. And what's always been interesting to me, uh, if you look at job satisfaction, for example, uh, what's always been interesting to me is that there's a disproportionate amount of academic literature on job satisfaction within the healthcare uh, industry, particularly within nursing um, and in places like ERs or NICUs. Or things like that. And it's because it's such a taxing, challenging type of a place to be and burnout rates are so high. And so lots of medical systems and hospitals are trying to figure out how can we reduce burnout? How can we increase job satisfaction? How can we attract and retain good people, right? Um, mm -hmm. All of that's so important. And so right. uh, for, that, for that reason, I think zooming in on this within your experiences is going to be very helpful today. And, and I agree. I, I think um, once we disconnect ourselves from a broader meaning and purpose and we're not getting fulfillment from the work that we do whether we're working construction in a factory uh teaching you know working in the medical field whatever whatever the job whatever the field if you're not feeling some sense of fulfillment and meaning and purpose and that you're contributing through what you're doing um burnout tends to be high especially when it's a it's a highly emotionally taxing type of a field to be in exactly I, too, have been reading quite a bit about burnout in doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, emergency medical technicians, and teachers. The teaching profession is getting hit really hard. And what people need to understand about burnout is that it affects absenteeism. It affects the quality of care, the performance. It affects, you mentioned, anxiety and depression. People who are burnt out go home and drink and smoke or smoke weed or do something that is a poor coping mechanism. When I was burnt out, I would go home and have a couple of glasses of wine every night. The wrong thing to do. Um, 
they give a poor quality of care in medicine and they actually um, leave the field early. 38% of nurses have left the field during this pandemic. Uh, some have entered into traveling nurse um, positions. Some have just quit early. My daughter works as a PICU nurse, pediatric ICU nurse, and the traveling nurses come in, the hospitals hire them, they pay them more than the regular staff who stayed there, and the traveling nurses don't know the unit, so they don't get the sicker patients, and they don't, may not do as good of a job, and the regular people who've stuck it out are having to work harder and orient the travelers. So it affects everybody. Those who get burned out and leave, those who move to a different area of work, those who stay and try to grin and bear it, it affects everybody. And absenteeism in the early retirement in medicine is going to affect you and your generation as you age, there will not be enough physicians to take care of all the gen Z's and all the millennials as they and, and I out. appreciate yeah and I appreciate you mentioning the the Jessica Grin and Barrett um, kind of comment it it's interesting you know a lot of times we hear things like that um, just Grin and Barrett um, resilience which I am a big believer in we want to be resilient and we we want to learn how to do hard things and to <laughs> find healthy coping mechanisms and all of that but just saying just Grin and Barrett or or essentially be, being dismissive of people's challenges and lived experiences and say, just get over it, um, isn't helpful. Uh, I had no. one friend, one friend years ago who was battling it. This wasn't in relation to the medical field at all, but she was battling, um, depression and anxiety and a family member, you know, when she said she was going to counseling and getting medication, a family member said, you know, scoffingly, why don't you just go to home Depot, buy some materials, build a bridge and get over it. Um, as, as if it was Ouch. just something she could just choose to be done with, right? Um, and we, that's harsh, right? But we, we hear those sorts of things in the workplace Yeah, we do. Um, all too frequently <clears throat> when people say, you know, check your emotions at the door, check your personal life at the door. Um, when you're at work, just work <clears throat> and, and don't let that other stuff bleed in. And that's just not the way it works. No. Um, and, and it goes the other way too. I can't just, especially if I'm in an in a area where I'm experiencing trauma on a daily basis, I can't just leave work and go home and automatically turn it off. Like it bleeds, right. it bleeds both ways. And so we have to be mindful of that as leaders, uh, be more considerate of our people who might be struggling, um, not fall into the trap of saying those sorts of dismissive and demeaning types of comments, even if we don't intend to, to be hurtful in any way. Uh, and then we need to be more proactive about dealing with the, the challenges people are facing. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, just grin and bear it is something that uh, doctors learn when they're interns. 
And it's part of the reason that physicians are not getting the help they need um, and not admitting that they're burnout or that they need therapy or just some sort of counseling, some sort of peer support. Um, just grin and bear it is the opposite of what we need to do. As leaders, we need to say, talking about that really difficult case that just came in, talking about that horrible outcome, sitting together as a team and saying, this really sucks, man, everybody feels bad because we lost that patient and we tried so, so hard to keep that patient alive. It affects the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the doctors, everyone. And when a leader allows the the whole team to talk about their feelings and to say, yeah, that, that was awful. We really lost that one or we blew that one. <clears throat> I'm not sure how it would work in other professions, but there are always going to be failures that teams experience, not death maybe, but, but failures. And, and if a team cannot talk about what went wrong, how to prevent it from going wrong again, um, how it affected your feelings, how much you carried that failure home with you on your shoulders, and how much you went and used abnormal coping to try to deal with it at home. Um, we've got to change that whole notion, the stigma that talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the stigma that talking about anxiety or depression or burnout is wrong, that we should keep that hidden. We should not keep those things hidden. Those things are very important. Some people are going to need paid leave to deal with these sorts of symptoms. Some workers will have to adjust their schedules. They'll have to get more flexibility. They'll have to say, I really need to cut my hours back right now. Some workers will say, I've got to have more than a four-day weekend. I need two weeks. I am burnt to a crisp or two months. I mean, in world, if you're burnt out, you should have six months off. It took me two years to recover when I was burnt out. I was working part at a real low risk delivery setting, taking care of normal mothers and babies. And I was doing the things that were making me feel better, but it took me literally two years to feel better. That's with therapy, psychotherapy, exercise regularly, music. I was playing the piano again, friendships. I was going out to eat with friends once a week. And um, what else was I doing? Cross-stitch process that allow still and think through things. So I was doing everything right to fix my burnout. And it took me a long time to recover. Yeah. Keep, and in, keep in mind that I had 30 years to, to, to build up this much burnout. But my right. point is, go away overnight, away in a long week. Yeah, yeah. And, and there really are so many different causes for the burnout. And it's not a one size fits all kind of a thing. So it's not like I can just, um, it, it's not necessarily easy to see uh, if, if we're not um, regularly communicating with our people and, and having a good relation, a good relationship of mutual accountability and trust where we can share with each other, right? Um, that's essential, um, because the causes are many, and, and they are different based on the person and their circumstances. Um, but what we know for sure is that there's a lot of negative long-term impacts on individual health, lots of negative impacts on, uh, from the organizational standpoint, productivity and efficiencies. And, um, you know, when someone's burned out, a lot of times um, quality of care or quality of performance de decreases. Absolutely. Um, things, get, things get missed innovation decreases, like all of these things for all the reasons why an organization might be interested beyond just the like treating people well. <laughs> right. Um, it, it's, you know, it really is a bottom line kind of an issue for businesses that they need to be paying close attention to. And I also know I need to look it up, but because uh, during the COVID time, my, my 
frame of reference in terms of time is all whacked. Um, mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't remember like when things happened exactly. But pre-pandemic, it, it, I think it was only maybe six months before the pandemic, um, there, there was an, uh, I'm not sure if it was an executive order or just kind of a, an administrative policy announcement, um, essentially saying that burnout was going to be considered part of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, and would be covered. And really? that's a tremendous that's thing. That's great. I, I'm sure it's going through the courts and I'm sure that, you know, people are wrestling with what does that actually mean? But, um, but yeah, it's, it, that's hugely important because, because it really is, um, you know, a, a really impactful thing that affects so many right. people in our labor force. One thing I, I do want to point out that a lot of people get confused. Burnout is a work-related syndrome. Major depression is different. This, a lot of the symptoms are shared, but major de- depression affects all aspects of your life. Your mood is depressed, your sleep is affected, your hunger is affected, your productivity is affected, and it really has nothing to do with work. It affects all your relationships. Burnout is specifically initiated in the workplace, and it is so significant. <clears throat> that the physician suicide rate is the highest suicide rate of any group of workers in the country. And a lot of that is stuffing those feelings down, not admitting that we're in trouble, not admitting we're stressed, not admitting we're pushed to the edge. And, and I think that's going to be transferable to other professions if we do not start talking about mental health and mental wellness and workplace culture, we will continue to see burnout. The pandemic has made everything worse and that's why it's so obvious. But if we don't take this opportunity to make workplace culture better, burnout's not gonna go away. Yeah, that's right. So in, in our last few minutes together, let's let's talk about that a little bit more, um, how we can go about supporting mental wellness in the workplace to reduce things like burnout and to increase the positive you know, environment for our employees to, to be able to thrive. How do we go about doing that as leaders? Well, um, Stanford has uh, done some research and suggested that having a wellness champion in the workplace is a good idea. The AMA has done lots of surveys and there are surveys available, just quick 10 item surveys, not the 50 item Maslick inventory. We survey our employees once a year. We have a wellness officer. We talk to our people. We ask for their input. We ask them about workflow. We ask about communication. We talk to them about how the help they're getting in in private physician offices. The physician should not be faxing things on their computer. The medical assistant should be faxing things or the secretary. Some people suggest huddling. I didn't like huddling in the NICU, but that's the, that's the notion that you get your manager, every worker and every assistant all together and every day. And you say, this is what we're going to do today. Is everybody clear? Some people say huddling is a, is a good idea. Uh, flexible schedules. We've got to have flexible schedules. If someone is over the edge, they need to go away for a few days and somebody else is going to have to come in and fill their slot. Data is important. One thing I learned in working with quality improvement with physicians is that they don't believe there are problems unless you have data to show their problems, whether it's birth injury or whether it's C-sections or whatever you're studying. So all workplaces must survey their workers. They have, they do monitor activity, they do monitor output, and they need to look at those data on a yearly basis. And workers need to know that they have a leader to go to who believes in wellness health, mental health and wellness. You're not going to go talk to someone if you think they're a Grin and Barrett kind of boss. Who's going to go talk to that kind of boss? You're going nowhere. You might as well Grin and Barrett. 
So there are many things that we could do in the workplace to make things better for people. If you sit down a group of workers, whether it's nurses, physicians, residents, respiratory therapists, and you say, how do you guys think things would work better here in the NICU at night? They all have a comment. They all have something to say. Say, oh, we could do this a little quicker. We could do this a little better. We could tweak it here and tweak it there. I mean, people care about their work. They all have input and good ideas. And leaders are going to have to listen to these ideas, accommodate the workers who need some time off if they're getting fried. Yeah, well, very well said, Susan. It has been a pleasure. I know at the time it has flown by and I need to let you go here in just a minute. Um, so many great um, tips there and, and so much per, uh, wonderful perspective that you share based on your long career. Before we close today, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background, um, where they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your book, uh, anything else like that, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my website is susanlandersmd.com. I have a blog there. I uh, am also a speaker and I can be contacted there. I wrote a book recently when I retired it's called So Many Babies, My Life Balancing a Busy Medical Career and Motherhood. I'm really passionate about working mothers because I think they're getting fried right now, too. The pandemic has really done a job on working mothers. You know, they're at, they're at home with remote learning. They're at home with their jobs. They're, whether their husband helps or not, we could talk for another hour about that situation. And of course, they've got all the pressure from work that you and I have just been talking about. <clears throat> so I would love for people to, who are interested in NICU stories and working mother stories to check out my book because I think there's a message there for working mothers. Um, let's see, the final word on burnout. Mental health is important. Mental wellness and mental health are important. And it's okay to talk about feeling bad when something goes wrong. Well said. I, I, I do think we need to be able to talk about this more openly, uh, just make it a part of the regular dialogue that happens in the workplace and with, you know, between leaders and their people, members of their team. Uh, just like any other performance conversation that may occur, that we need to be talking regularly about mental wellness in the workplace and burnout and other related issues. Susan, it has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what uh, Susan and uh, her, her team can do for you. Check out her book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. 
We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.